I'm praying that your word shared will bear fruit in our lives through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. It is a great joy for me to share God's word with you. Our topic for this day is obedience to authority. Obedience to authority. Over two decades ago, a colleague of ours, he was the principal of the Mbari campus, the Reverend Dr. Stephen Mungoma, was visiting our diocese. By that time, I was still in our diocese serving. I think it is nearly three decades ago. And he was mission coordinator for the province at the time. He helped me grasp the distinction between authority and power. The distinction between authority and power. And he used the image of a traffic police officer. And this is what he said. He said, by virtue of their uniform, when they raise up their hand and you are driving, you stop. Because they are authorized to do that. If you try to do that, no one will mind you. They will think there is something wrong in your mind. But they are authorized. It doesn't matter whether the police officer is short or tall or female. Once they put up their hand, you stop if you are a law-abiding citizen. But as you are aware, there are those stubborn drivers. They ignore. When you ignore, they communicate to their colleagues ahead of you. This time when you meet them, you don't only really find them with authority, you find them with power, with a gun. And because drivers have been stubborn, you realize that at every traffic station these days, there is an ordinary police officer with what? With the power, the gun. Power is what enables you to exercise your authority. We are looking at authority. Jesus had disciples who were authorized to carry on his ministry. But he did tell them to wait in Jerusalem until they received power, Acts chapter 1, verse 8. As we are gathered here, we come from various generations. Those of my generation, you are aware that we respected authority. The authority of our parents, the authority of our teachers, the elders on the village. We never questioned or disobeyed instructions. That's how I was brought up. But we have among us another generation, including my tiny grandchildren. They question their parents. Tiny. These are three, four-year-olds. Say, no, daddy, no. We have that generation who question everything. And they don't like to be told what to do. They don't like to be told what to do. There are those among us here who belong to that generation. Then there are those who abuse the legitimate authority that they have been given. Those who abuse the legitimate authority that they have been given. Based on our text that has been so well read for us, Romans 13 verses 1 to 7, I will essentially emphasize one main point. Namely, that those who are believers in Jesus Christ, all of us who say praise the Lord and confess Jesus as Lord and Savior and say they belong to God, are duty bound, are commanded are commanded to obey legitimate authority over them. 
they are commanded to obey the governing authorities. That's what I will essentially really be talking about. That once you say you are a child of God, you are duty bound. And I will be emphasizing that we don't have an option. If you are a Christian, you don't have an option when it comes to obedience to legitimate authority. Towards the end of my sharing, I will respond to a question I have been asked many times. Uh, there are no circumstances or situations where you can disobey authority. So I will conclude with that, but mainly it is about you and I who say we are Christians being subject and submissive to legitimate authority. Paul writes this letter to the believers. It is addressed to believers in Rome. They were predominantly Gentiles. They were not Jewish, though there were, there were some among them who were Jewish. The emperor at the time was Emperor Nero. But by the time Paul writes, he has not as yet started persecuting the church. And the state did many evil things. Even their court systems were very, very biased. But you know, Paul is addressing Christians. Right from the beginning of this letter, in chapter 1, he explores the state of mankind without God and how that attracts the wrath of God. If you read chapter 2 of Romans, and then in chapter 3 and the following chapters, he points to them what God has done in Christ Jesus in drawing each one of us to himself in Christ. And the following chapters demonstrate God's love in Jesus Christ for us. That when you are in Christ Jesus, Romans 8, 1, 8, 1 there is no condemnation. Chapters 12 to 16, and our chapter falls in that block of material, focus on how the believers in Christ ought to conduct their lives. And in this particular case, he's saying the believers in Jesus Christ ought to be submissive, to be obedient to legitimate authority. The Greek word translated obey or submit is a present passive imperative word and the imperative component of it emphasizes the fact that it is not an option. It is a command. So he says in verse 1, let every person be subject to the governing authorities. He is not giving them an option. It is not something you can choose to do or not to do. He says, let all. No one is left out. He's saying, now that you are believers, this is how you ought to conduct yourselves in relationship to the governing authorities. You don't have an option, but to obey. Obedience to authority should characterize us as believers, as men and servants and women who confess Jesus as Lord and Savior. You would want to ask, why did Paul ask the believers to submit to these leaders who are not even Christians? Who are not even Christians? There is a tendency among believers, among Christians, to think of the state leadership as evil. So they say, you know, for me, my allegiance is to Christ Jesus. We sing that song here. My allegiance is to God. Yes, but Paul is saying, okay, that is understood. 
but there is this component. When you are a believer, you ought to be obedient. Be obedient. Sometimes I've been embarrassed, but left with no choice to send out students from my class. Some of them are here. They know I do it. I tell them, please, and I teach Bible. So I say, come with the Bible. They say, no, we won't come with the Bible. Obedience. Obedience. Paul says, they are pagan rulers, yes, but you must be obedient to them. Why should you be obedient to them? Paul goes ahead to explain in verse 1. For there is no authority except from God. At the last celebration of the Janan Luum, St. Janan Luum Day, on 6th of February, I think it was General Kahindo Tafire who was struggling with the fact that Amin's leadership could have come from God. He said, Did you have even Amin who killed the Archbishop? And you keep telling us that there is no authority that exists apart from God? Yes. Even I mean. Paul says there is no authority that exists except from God. And those in authority exist because they have been instituted by God. So one, they are there because God has put them there. You may not like me. You may not like our vice chancellor. You may not like your dean. But he's in authority. It doesn't matter. You have a duty to obey him or her. As a Christian, remember Paul is addressing believers. There is a contradiction if you are a believer and a disobedient. Those two don't match. They don't match. Authorities are put there by God. It may not necessarily be God's will. But God will have allowed it. We shall ask God when we get there to heaven, was it really your will to give us a mean? But one sure I'm certain of that God allowed it. There are things God allows when they are not necessarily his will. But there is no leadership that can exist when God has not allowed it. So he says, there is no authority except from God. And he says there is no authority that exists unless it has been put there by God. But he says that to resist them, and you say this leader, I don't like him, so I will resist him. He says to resist the leaders is to resist God. Verse 2. Therefore, whoever resists authority, resists what God... So think twice. You don't have to agree with that leader necessarily. You don't have to like him. He may not be appealing. She may not be appealing to you. You may not have voted him in power, but he's there. He's the president. He's his excellency. You know, there are many things that have happened in Uganda. I remember someone being swearing himself in as the president of Uganda. He says he's the people's president. Which people? There is a legitimate president who has the instruments of power. So you can't set up yourself. You may not agree with him, but he's the one authorized to be head of this nation. So when you resist him, you resist that which God has put in place. And he says there are consequences of that. You will incur judgment, maybe divine judgment, but also judgment from those authorities. Because I've told you, they have power. They have power. Our vice chancellor here, I know, we normally call him a cool vice chancellor, and he's cool. But that man has power. I was here when they installed him, and they gave him instruments of power. One time we were in a staff meeting and these staff members were trying to dodge dodge around and doing things the wrong way. 
and he told them in a very strong voice, I've never seen him be affirmative like that, go and do the right thing. And then he followed up with a letter with his signature. And within a week, they had done the right thing. <laughs> they had done something I had been telling them for over two years. Because I'm not authorized and I don't have power. <laughs> he has power. He has power. So when you resist, you incur judgment. He has power to discipline us. The authority, the state has power, has instruments to punish us. But above all, God has that power to discipline us, to pass judgment on us. In verse 4, he says, tells us that these governing authorities, these human authorities, they are servants of God. They are servants of God. That's what he says in verse 4. For this authority is God's servant for your own good. The leaders we have as our servants for our own good. They are there for our own good. For me, I, I go to bed and sleep. But the vice chancellor doesn't sleep until he's sure at the end of the month I will get my salary in my account on 23rd of every month. So he is there for my own. Your class representative is there for your own. So be obedient to them. Respect those in authority over you. They are there for your own good. They are there for my own good. And he says they bear the sword. They have power to use force. Certainly the government has guns to use force to implement the authority that has been given to them, including the collection of taxes that he mentions in chapter 6 and 7. So my brothers and sisters, we are duty bound to obey those in authority, those who have been put above us. And we have various levels of authority. There is authority in this university. There is the chancellor, there is the vice chancellor, there is the deputy vice chancellor in charge of academics. He is the second in command, at least the way you know it. Then there are deans, there are directors, there are professors, there are lecturers. We are all in authority. There, are, there is the guild government. There is the guild government. There are class representatives. All those are levels of authority in this university. And we must submit to them as Christians, as believers in Jesus Christ. And so when they tell us to pay our dues, on Tuesday the vice chancellor was here, please pay your tuition. Pay. He may not tax us, but we have dues that we have to pay. Pay your dues. Also pay for the house I stayed in, I stay in here, it is not free. I pay rent. And those who stay in university houses pay rent. We must pay our dues. We must pay our taxes. So all believers in Christ Jesus are duty bound to obey those in authority, to obey the state authorities. We shouldn't be found to be among those who are rebels, who are rebels. Even at family level, we ought to to obey and respect authority. Let me now, as I conclude, respond to this question. Are there no circumstances or situations that warrant disobeying authority? Are there no exceptions? 
Are there situations when you can say no to legitimate authority? And I want to say there are those situations, and I will mention some of them, that require you to say, Your Excellency, the Guild President, Your Excellency, Vice Chancellor, sir, this one, no. One area that is very obvious is when authority requires you to do something that is sinful. One time I've worked in religious institutions all my working life, and one time I was working in this institution, which was also Christian, as we are. And I was heading one of the sections. There was a staff member in my section. So my, the CEO calls me that we have agreed as senior management that you suck this member of staff serving under you and replace him with this other member of staff. And I said, why? I'm the one supervising this staff. There has not been any issues with this staff. They said, that's what we have decided as senior management. Then I found out, they told me the person who was coming, whom these two senior management fellows were recommending, including the one who was writing my appointment letter. The one they were bringing belonged to their tribe. The one they wanted me to suck didn't belong to their tribe. I didn't belong to any of those tribes. As you know, I come from a minority tribe in Uganda. So there are not many of us you find in places. So I, I told the, my boss, I said, I'm a Christian. My Christian convictions don't allow me to do that. So either you do it on your own, don't follow me at all. I cannot do or be part to that. You can say no. I don't want to be involved in tribalism issues. After a few months, I meet this sister who was supposed to, and she meets me and says, now Edison, I'm told you are the one who refused it. And I was frank with her. She was even a reverend. I said, that was a case of tribalism. And for me, tribalism has no room in my life as a believer. When it involves sinning, you have a right to say no. You say no. You have a right to say no to legitimate authority where sin is involved. Daniel refused. If you read Daniel chapter 3, verse 17 and 18, the case of Daniel, Meshach, and Abednego, they refused, we shall not bow down before this image. And we shall not. They made it very clear to King Nebuchadnezzar. They were even willing to suffer the consequences. Where it involves sin. Or something that stands in the way of God. You have a right to say no. It was a time I was put under pressure to give exams to a student who hadn't attended my course, and I said no. Student didn't attend my course, is not sitting my examination. That's according to the examination rules. I have a copy. <laughs> but I think somehow they went and set a separate exam for him and went and inserted the marks in my mark sheet. That's criminal. <laughs> so I went and reported the case to the vice chancellor he's handling it. Someone in the academic central did that. It was not done at my faculty. And I won't rest until that person is found who did that. You have a right to say no when there is sin. 
Mr. Vice Chancellor, there is a lot of pressure on staff members to pass students who have failed. And you know it has happened to me. Past students who have failed. Staff members get surprised when they see their students who failed their paper graduating. <laughs> and one staff member who was a part-timer, it is even worse with the part-timers, who said, no, I will not do that. The next semester, she wasn't put on the timetable. In Uganda Christian University. No. You say no. I'm encouraged by girls who are refusing sexual advances from lecturers. Very encouraged. And there is this particular case which I'm sure the Vice Chancellor is going to handle it, it may not have come to you. I think Senate must take seriously these cases of missing marks. Why should marks miss? Why? And this is a, a, a case of a lecturer who holds on to a student's marks and says, I can find these marks if you allow me to sleep with you. That must not happen. That case will come to you, Mr. Vice Chair. If it doesn't, ask. Ask me, I will tell you who are those people who are involved. <laughs> that person, I, I love the, and they fear, they fear to report, they, to report us. But if they are lecturers who are doing that, one member who had it, wanted to, said I want to go for a weekend. I never assumed that this could happen in UCU. He wanted to go away, but then he had engagements here, he couldn't. Such a person should even be announced here so that others learn from him. <laughs> so that your daughters are free with us. Why should they be suspecting us? Why? These young girls have come here to study, not to be married. There are those moments when you can say no to legitimate authority, particularly if it involves sinning. Or if a leader is overstepping the boundaries of what he's supposed to do. You have a right to say no. And for me, once something involves sin, you, there is no way, it doesn't matter who you are. It really doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether I'm going to be sent away. Sometimes I'm prepared to go away. <laughs> yes, sometimes I'm prepared to go away. One time I did something that would have required me to be expelled from this university because my bosses felt embarrassed. And this was in the first university council and I was part of management. The policy was all issues taken to the council must pass through management. This particular one didn't. I was representing staff in the council. They were going to pass something that was going to harm staff. And so I put up my hand and I said, but we haven't discussed that in the management. The chairman of council was Bishop Valgad Seka. They said, is it true this has not been discussed in management? They said, yes. So he said, why did you bring it here? So my bosses were so embarrassed, I thought after that. <laughs> I thought I was going to go. But of course, when they were reconstituting the council, when the term was over, I was excluded. Trusted me to go and represent them in the university council. <laughs> my brothers and sisters, Two things that I've been saying. One, that as believers, we have a duty. We are commanded. It is not an option to obey or not to obey. We should 
be obedient and submissive to legitimate authority. But also secondly, that you should not sin because authority has told you to do so. I was talking to one of my brothers, very wonderful brother. He had been involved in something I thought, not just thinking which was sinful. I said, brother, over many years ago, you preached a sermon on integrity. I still have a copy of the sermon. Why did you do this? And he just mentioned one word, power. Power caused me to do that. It shouldn't. You have a right to say no. No one has a heaven he will take me to. No one here, even the chaplain doesn't have a heaven, <laughs> he will take me to. And for me, I live to please Jesus. I, I live so Jesus can receive me when I've finished my journey here on earth. So I will not do anything that would harm that journey. And I pray that as obedient children of God, you'll be obedient. When they say we shouldn't throw litter, that you can carry rubbish and put it in the bins and keep our campus clean, but also that you will know that you don't have to sin because authority is forcing you to do that. Praise the Lord. Amen.